Well, greetings, everyone. You're listening to the morning service of the Lower Derby United Baptist Church. And we are here in worship as we are serving the Lord. And we greet all of you who are listening on Life Radio in the city of Miramichi, New Brunswick. And then those who are watching on YouTube, what a joy to know that you are listening today. We are talking about prophecy during the month of October. And today I want to talk about the worldwide tribulation that is coming. You probably heard the old phrase, red sky at night, sailors delight, red in the morning, sailors take warning. That's an old phrase, but it does come from the Bible. It's found in Matthew chapter 16, and in Luke chapter 12, it's repeated in the Bible. It kind of tells us that if we look around uh, in the atmosphere, we'd be, be able to tell what the weather might be over the next little while. You may not be a meteorologist, or you may not know much about the, the jet stream and how it, how it goes and all of that, but sometimes it is quite easy to tell if there's uh, bad weather on the horizon. If you have seen a ring around the moon at night or a bright pink horizon in the morning, they're fairly reliable indicators. Well, there are things in the world today that seem to indicate that we are nearing the end times. So before we get into that, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We ask that you'll speak to our hearts in the moments that we have looking into it today. Help us to understand the text that you caused to be written so many years ago. I pray and ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It isn't surprising that in our world today, there are many uh, people who are saying uh, things are closing down. We must be nearing the end times. As a matter of fact, when you read the newspaper or when you listen to the news, something is happening in our world. Things are dramatically changing. And there are a lot of even fortune tellers who are telling us things are changing, seers of one kind and another. Well, in Matthew chapter 24, the theme is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Please note that. Jesus will return to the earth. He will bring to an end at the present age of man and bring in his glorious kingdom. The disciples had asked Jesus three questions. Have you ever asked someone a question and they gave you a sermon for an answer? Well, they asked three questions and Jesus gave them a sermon for the answer. You say, what are the three questions? They're in Matthew 24, verse three. Tell us when these things will be. What shall be the sign of thy coming? The second question. And when will be the end of the age? And then Jesus answers the questions. You see, Jesus had just said to the disciples that, uh, that the temple was going to be destroyed. And that really took them by surprise. It put their minds in what the old word I use, in a tither. What's going on? This beautiful temple is going to be destroyed. After all, you know, these disciples of Christ were just ordinary country men. They had never seen such a massive structure as the temple. This temple had been refurbished by Herod and it had white marble on it. And Jesus said that all of a sudden this is going to be destroyed. They couldn't believe their, what he was saying. As a matter of fact, the temple had stones in it, uh, solid stones that were 40 feet long. And they were 12 feet wide and, and uh, they were 12 feet high. Some of the stones weighed 100 tons. And Jesus is saying that the temple's going to be destroyed. Uh, wow. Uh, tell us, Lord Jesus, more about that. Because the temple was the hub. It was the busy place in the life of the Jewish people. If you've ever been to the land of Israel, you've seen some of the stones that held up the, the retaining wall of the temple. It's now called the Wailing Wall. That's a part of what was here when Jesus was talking. So beginning at Matthew chapter 24 and getting to verse number four, Jesus is giving then answer to their question. When are these things going to happen? When, uh, when, when, when's the end of the age coming? And Jesus starts to answer those questions. Now, please understand that the signs given in Matthew chapter 24 deal with the coming of Christ to reign on the earth. These are not signs for the rapture of the church. We talked about the rapture last week. In God's prophetic program as revealed in scripture, the next big event to take place is the rapture of the church. After that, on earth, there's seven years of great tribulation. And then the great tribulation will end with the battle of Armageddon and the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth to destroy the armies of the earth and to set up his kingdom. The things in Matthew 24 are things that are going to happen in the great tribulation period, signs that Jesus is soon to return to the earth and to set up his kingdom on the earth. 
Matthew chapter 24 is known as the Olivet Discourse. If you read chapter 23, Jesus pronounces seven woes on the Jewish people and particularly on the religious leaders. And uh, after they, are, they leave Jerusalem, they walk across the Kidron Valley, they go up into the Mount of Olives, and the, Jesus and the disciples there are, are given, uh, Jesus gives an answer to the disciples to their questions. This uh, Matthew 24 is the longest prophetic section in the New Testament next to the book of Revelation, okay? And it's the second longest sermon Jesus ever gave. The longest sermon Jesus ever gave was the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The second longest sermon Jesus ever gave was what we call the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew chapter 24. And as I said, it's uh, next to the book of Revelation in the New Testament. It, it gives us the most full view of what's going to happen in the future. Um, let, let's just go through some of these things. I read some of these and alluded to them last week. Let's talk about them in a little more detail. Some of the signs. Now you notice in verse 4, Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceives you. So the first sign, there's going to be in the future great deception. It says, Take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. I think last week I mentioned a fellow who lived a number of years ago by the name of David Koresh. Uh, in Waco, Texas, some of you remember of the, the burning of that place and all those people who lost their lives. They were a, a, a religious cult known as the Branch Davidians. And uh, he said that he was the Christ. Many people have said that. I don't know if you've heard about the man in Northern California who said he was going to start building a city, a holy city. And uh, he expected that any time... The, the legislatures in Washington, D.C. would be calling him up so that he could solve the problems of the world because he figured he was the Christ. Uh, and that, uh, that, that's just crazy, isn't it? But it says in the last times, it says, uh, take heed that no one deceives you. In the last days, religious deception is going to be on the, in, on the increase. Can I say this? Spiritual deception will increase because spiritual gullibility will increase. Do you know why so many people are gullible to false doctrine and to deception? It's because they do not know what the Bible teaches. We're living in a day and age, and I, and I, I hesitate in a sense to be so blunt and say this, but many people no longer know what the Bible says. And because they're not grounded in the scriptures, they fall for every little thing that they hear. Can I just say this, and, and I won't say much more than this. The Bible has been replaced in many churches, and the emphasis today is put on music and feeling instead of on teaching and understanding what the Scripture says. And uh, it says here that in the latter time, we see it. We're not in the Great Tribulation. We're going to go up in the rapture if we know Jesus Christ. But we already see uh, worldwide deception taking place, and that parallels over to the book of the Revelation. Now, if, you, if you're using your Bible this morning, you're gonna, we're going to flip back and forth. So don't lose Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. In Revelation 6, when the first seal is opened, it says, I looked and behold a white horse. Uh, that, that's interesting because when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom in Revelation chapter 19, he comes riding on a white horse. This is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. This is the world ruler that's going to arise and govern the world after Christians are raptured and taken up to heaven. And he's a deceiver because he is, he's on a white horse indicating that he's the Christ when he's not the Christ. It says he comes sitting on a white horse and it says that him that sat on it had a bull. Now a bull will never hurt you. It, it, it's, the, it's the arrows that are shot from the bow that hurt you, right? This guy doesn't have any, he just has a bow. So he's not going to uh, take over and conquer the world by, by fighting at this point. He is going to do it by diplomacy. My sakes, how many, how many meetings have we got today to try to solve problems? And then they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk and they don't. Uh, someone said they do all, all kinds of talking, but they don't say anything. And nothing seems to ever be solved. 
And notice what it says. And it says, and a crown was given unto him. You see, after the rapture of the church takes place, uh, the earth is going to be left in, uh, in, in, in rather terrible shape. Economics are going to be terrible. Financially, it's going to be terrible. Uh, Food-wise, it's going to be terrible. And a man is going to come who says he has all the answers. And, and uh, nations are going to submit to his rule over them. A crown was given, says, and he went forth to conquer and to conquer. It always makes me think, and I, I didn't live in the days of, of Adolf Hitler. But I've read a bit about Adolf Hitler, and I've been to the Holocaust Museum outside the city of Jerusalem and heard the story. And I'm told that, that his spell over the, particularly over the German people, was, was rather hypnotic. I'm told that when he would uh, give his speeches, people would be, would be spellbound, and strong men would, would mourn, and women would cry. Uh, they were so taken in and brainwashed. Uh, it was a fanatical allegiance that they had to Adolf Hitler. We know all the, the terrible deception that he brought upon people. And then if you study back in history, again, before my time, Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a bearded, angry Jewish man. He was a journalist, an economist, a uh, historian, and a philosopher. And if you read his writings, you can't really make much sense of any of them. But the world at the time of Karl Marx was fascinated by him. And followed him. And look at the legacy of communism today. And uh, in the end times, many are going to be deceived. One of the characteristics of the coming of the Lord to the earth is deception. We see it in our day. If you want to read it, it uh, talks about deception in the church. Read the book of 2 Timothy. Read chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. And you're going to find there's a lot of deception. So uh, that's the first that's the first sign that's given here. Beware of deception. Uh, many people are obviously deceived in our day. Some crazy thing comes on comes on the internet or is circulated somewhere and, and people fall for it. A, a Bible verse is pulled out of here and a Bible verse is pulled out of there. None of the Bible verses are kept in context and, and they're made. You can make the Bible say anything you want, you know, if you just pull verses from here and there and put your own interpretation on it. That doesn't mean what you're saying is right. And that's what's happening in the world in which we live today. Let's go on to the second mark. The second mark will be de dissension. Now notice what it says here uh, in verse number five. It says, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, deceive many, verse six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now in the original text in the Greek, it says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's in what we call the continual tense, which means that you'll, you'll just hear of wars and rumors of wars constantly. That's what it's talking about. Unending commotion is a sign of the coming of Christ to set up his kingdom on the earth. So I call this, there'll be some hot wars, that's real fighting, right? And there'll be some cold wars, uh, because that's, that's what's indicated here. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Oh, there's an awful lot of conflict over our world, isn't there? It, it, it's unbelievable what's going on. I like to read some secular writers once in a while, I don't read them a lot, but Leon Trotsky said this. He said, if anyone is seeking a peaceful world, he lived, uh, he picked the wrong century to be born in. If anybody wants a peaceful world, they picked the wrong century to be born in. That certainly describes the day and age in which we live. Now let's go and look at, we looked at seal number one in Revelation 6. Let's look at seal number two, see what it's talking about. Verse three. And I opened the second seal and I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And another horse is fiery red. <laughs> Guess what that is? That's bloodshed, fiery red. And it was granted to him Saturday, to take peace from the earth. They should kill one another. And it was given to him a great sword. So uh, you, you can see there's a parallel. What Jesus is describing to the disciples in Matthew chapter 24, we see the parallel happening here in the book of Revelation. Uh, let's go on the third one. I call the third one, uh, the third D, I call it devastation. Now, if you look at, at the verses here, it says in verse 7, it says, For nation um, shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Wow. <laughs> um, it, it just, it, it's terrible what, what goes on here and what's talked about. It says, uh, and there will be famines. And then it says pestilences. <laughs> and and uh, wow, that's what's going to happen. That, that's, that's the black horse over in Revelation chapter 6. Read the third seal. Look at verse 5. I opened the third seal. It says, come and see. And it was a black horse. And him that sat in it had scales in his hand. And, and here's, a, notice the price of food. It says, a quart of wheat for a denarius. 
That's a day's wages in the days of the New Testament. And, and three quarts of barley, that's the poor people's food for, for a penny, for a denarius. It says, do not hurt the oil and the wine. The, the rich want, want the oil and the wine. So, so you see what's, what's happening. I don't, are you aware of the fact that 24,000 people die every day in our world because of starvation and malnutrition? 24,000. That's going to increase. That's, that's, that's going to increase. It takes 1.2 billion metric tons to meet the supply for the world's minimum demands so people can eat. And nearly all of the agricultural land on planet Earth, 1.6 billion acres, is now already being farmed. There's no more good land to farm to produce food. Our world. Climatologists say that, uh, uh, hinting that the weather patterns are changing. Don't we hear that every night on the news? And it's going to have disastrous effects on the world and all of this kind of thing. That's what's talked about here. A sign of the end times. Uh, devastation. Devastation. Uh, not only wars, rumors of wars. It says famines. Um, pestilences. We all know what pestilences is. Pestilences is disease. Pestilences is virus. It's, it's plagues. Uh, I wrote down in my notes that uh, pestilence is an outbreak of disease. Uh, at an epic nature. And, and, and we're in a, a big pandemic right now. That, that's what it's all about. We, we know that the problem is, in our day, is the, the overuse of antibiotics and sulfur drugs. We're told now that to combat some viruses and things that people have, it takes several uh, antibiotic drugs all to be used at the same time in the hopes that they can stop the disease or the virus or the infection. Uh, that, that's the way it is. And earthquakes, didn't it mention the word earthquakes here? Pest, and earthquakes in various places. Uh, ha, how far back do we want to go talk about earthquakes? Or do we just want to talk about the one in Japan this week? Uh, and there was another one in some other part of the world this week. And uh, sometimes volcanoes are the result of earthquakes, of the ground shaking and, 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 and lava is, is spewed out. I remember a few years ago, um, Peter Wilson of California he said that the most costly earthquake the United States ever had um, was in January of 94. And matter of fact, uh, I know a little bit about that because I remember studying about it at the time. It, it attacked uh, a certain part of uh, California known as Northridge. And that's where all the, the pornographic industries are, where they produce pornographic magazines and films and so on. And many of those uh, businesses were, were destroyed. Uh, earthquakes, it's going to happen. You know, what the, you know what they call earthquakes? And these just think, they call them, uh, the insurance companies call them acts of God. Did you know that they are acts of God? They are really acts of God. You say, how do you know that? Well, I've read Isaiah. Isaiah, listen to this. Isaiah 29, verse 6. Thou shalt be visited by the Lord of hosts with earthquakes and great noise. Read it for yourself. So famines and earthquakes and viruses and plagues are acts of God. God is speaking. God is speaking. You say, how do you know plagues are acts of God? Let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Egypt. Let's talk about the, the Exodus. Let's talk about, about uh, uh, Moses being sent to Pharaoh to let my people go and leave the land of Egypt. And what did God bring on the land of Egypt? Acts of God. Remember that? There was the plague of Moraine on the cattle. There was their boils. There were frogs. Flies, all that stuff. Why was all that happening? I bet you the sciences, science would have some explanation for that, wouldn't they? Uh, but they were acts of God. God was speaking. And so when you see all of these things happening, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this. This has been around for a while. People have said that Los Angeles sits on three fault lines. And they're, they're predicting that sometime before too long, uh, the scientists say, that there will be a large earthquake in the Los Angeles area that will measure 8.3 or higher on the Richter scale and will kill, they've said, between three and 14,000 people. Earthquake, sign of the end times. Sign of the end times. Sign of Jesus Christ getting ready, he's gonna come. We see these things now. We're not in the great tribulation, but these signs are, are starting to increase. Now, notice what it says here. It says, these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, if you understand the original language of the Bible, the beginning of sorrows 
means these are the beginning of, can I say it this way? These are the beginning of labor pains. Now, I'm not a lady, but my wife had a couple of boys. And I know this, that labor pains start out infrequently and slow and not too strong at the beginning. Now, correct me, ladies, if I'm wrong on that. I never felt the pain myself, thank goodness. Uh, uh, and then as time goes along, the labor increases, right? The frequency increases and the strength of the pain increases. And doctors had nurses monitor that so they know when to arrive to deliver the baby. Right on. That's, that's the way it is. These things here that we've just described, Jesus said, are the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. There's going to be a buildup towards my coming. It's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. Now, I want you to notice desecration would be the fourth sign. And you look at that in verse number nine. It says, they will deliver you up uh, to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Uh, worldwide persecution of God's people. That's what it's talking about. Here in the context, talking about worldwide persecution, particularly of the Jewish people. And, and it, it will be, of course, of Christian people. They're going to deliver you up. You say, what's the deliver you up mean? Well, take out the word deliver up, but they're going to arrest you. That's exactly what do you, do you see do you see an animosity growing towards God's people these days? We won't get into talking about how many pastors in Canada in the last year have been arrested, will we? But that's it's all coming down that it's all coming down there. And there's going to be uh, well if you if you want to read over we won't go, we won't go back and forth over here but if you want verse 7 of Revelation chapter 6 the fourth seal says come and see and it was a pale horse. And the pale horse, of course, was death in Hades. And uh, power was given on them to slay people that are, that are on the earth. During the time of the Great Tribulation, there's going to be 144,000 preachers. 144,000 people who are going to be sealed. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses according to the Jehovah's Witness cult. They are 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're going to be the preachers during the time of the Great Tribulation. You say, where is that found in the Bible? Revelation 7. And the reason why they're sealed, they're sealed so that the Antichrist and the anti-God forces cannot kill them. And they're going to preach the gospel throughout the world. And many are going to be saved through their preaching. And many of those who are saved through their preaching will die, will pay for trusting Christ with giving their blood, their lives. Uh, are, are you aware of this? Missionary activity is illegal in 50 countries in the world today. One fourth of all of the countries of the world that we live in, it is illegal to preach the gospel. Isn't that amazing? They're shutting her down, aren't they? There's hatred. There's hatred. Not only is there anti-Semitism, uh, but there's uh, going to be brutality towards people who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that was the, that was the fourth sign, wasn't it? The fifth one is defection. You, you'll see it here. It's 10 to 13. It says that many will be offended and betray one another. They will hate one another. And many false prophets will deceive many. Uh, that, that's what's going to happen. Uh, in, in the future, there's going to be uh, unprecedented religious apostasy. When Christians start being martyred, uh, people who are superficially connected to Christ are going to be traced. Say, oh, so-and-so there, so-and-so is a Christian, get him. And they'll do that to try to save their own neck. That's what's talked about here in the passage. Many will sell out their family members and their, their, uh, their blood kin to make sure of their own safety and to save them themselves. Believing Jews will be uh, betrayed by unbelieving Jews. And then look what he says here in verse 13. And we're going to have to, I think, wind it down here with this verse. It says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. This is this little verse, verse 13, is one of the most misinterpreted verses in Christianity today. People think, many people think and say this. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you must endure and hold on and be good to the end or you're going to go to hell. That is wrong. That is wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. 
If you take this verse out of context, you can make it say anything. They that endure to the end will be saved. That means this. In the context, people living in the great tribulation period of time, with all this persecution and with all this hatred, if their lives, if, they're, if they endure and they're not killed to the end of the great tribulation, they will be saved by the coming of Christ. To end the battle of Armageddon and to set up his kingdom. In other words, they will go right from the great tribulation period right into the kingdom age of Christ. The 1,000 year reign of Christ. That's what this verse is saying. It's not saying that after you're saved, to stay saved, you have to do good works and be good. Listen, salvation is all by grace. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. And we're going to go to heaven by grace. And works have no part of it. And if we're truly saved, our works ought to show we're saved, but they have no part in keeping us saved. They are just revealing that we're saved. A very interesting verse. And something says here, it says, and, and the last iniquity is going to abound. Lawless is going to abound. Boy, lawless is abounds. Uh, I, I, I read this week. I couldn't believe this. I read two, two different articles, I must have been on Facebook or somewhere, of, of two different gentlemen who get up and their, their, uh, their truck was stolen from their yard overnight. Lawlessness abounds. It's everywhere. The, the, the way people behave is, is terrible. It said, and, and the love of many will wax cold. Is it true that the, uh, 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 as we think of Christians, that, that the love of many waxes cold? Many Christians are not on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Christians don't talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. It means it's easier not to talk about the Lord because if you do, people look at you like you're an egghead, right? That's how many people feel. So, 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 so the devil has been successful in, in shutting people up. These are signs of the end times. These are signs that will explode during the time of the Great Tribulation. And they're signs that Jesus Christ is coming again soon. You know, the sixth sign is, I call it Declaration. And it's right here, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world for a witness to, to all nations. Then the end will come. During the time of the great tribulation, the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world. You say, by who? By the 144,000. Uh, also by uh, God sends an angel down from heaven and preaches the gospel throughout the whole world. Uh, it, it's, it's just amazing, isn't it? Uh, the, does the gospel have to be preached throughout the whole world before the rapture? No, 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 no. That's keep, keep the verse in its context. The gospel will be preached throughout the whole world during the time of the great tribulation. And then the end will come. Signs of the times. That's just a little bit of the great. It goes on from here and talks about how bad it's going to get in the great tribulation. I won't talk about that in, in, in the weeks that are ahead. My question to you this morning is, do you know Jesus as your Savior? My question. You know, some people have really faulty thinking. You know what the faulty thinking is? They say, well, if the gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world in the future in time of the Great Tribulation, if I don't go up in the rapture because I'm not saved and I'm in the truth, if the gospel is going to be preached throughout the world in the Great Tribulation, I'll wait till then and trust Christ as Savior. No, no, you won't. Because if you heard the gospel today and refused it, you won't believe it. In the time of the great tribulation. You will be under strong delusion. Under judgmental delusion. Because you refused in the age of grace. You say is that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians 2. Explains that out very clearly. So it's important. Today is the day you have friends. I wrote down in my notes. We only have the guarantee. Of this moment. That's why the Bible says. Now. Is the accepted time. Now's the day of salvation. Trust Jesus as your Savior today. If you don't, and the rapture takes place, you'll fall hook, line, and sinker and believe the deceiver, the Antichrist, and follow him. Father, help those today who have heard your word. May the Spirit of God take it home to the heart and draw those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ to yourself. Lord, that they might come and trust you and be born again, be forgiven of their sin. Father, we ask now that you will uh, cause the word of God to grow in our hearts. Help us to chew it over and to meditate upon it. May it make a difference in the way we live. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.